Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Very excited to be talking about peace technology. We have Jingxia New joining us on the show. Hello. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on, Jingxia. Very excited to talk about, especially your new book, Peace Tech. Super Thank excited. Thank you. Thank you. And for those who don't know Jingxia's background, Jingxia is a journalist and an author. And you can find Jingxia's links below, jingxianu.com, as well as the Amazon book link. So do check those out. Okay, Jingxia, let's start with understanding who you are, where you were born. You're born in Jingzhou in the Henan province in China. Uh, grew up in a city about two hours outside of there. You were telling me that you guys make all your food, make all your clothes, all this cool stuff. So teach us about where you're born. Yes. So it is a very remote uh, mountain area where I grew up with, but you know, it's so beautiful and people there live very simple, very simple, even very hard, you know, hard working life, but very happy. So we do have a lot of, um, you know, activities just in the nature. Um, and I think that's why when I, after I grew up, I was keep looking for the same thing, you know, it's just a harmony with nature and with people surrounding you. And that's what I have when I grow up and I'm just, I just think it's great and everyone should have that. And I think it's also related to, you know, yes. later I'm writing book and later I become Buddhist. So the same thing in my heart. So. I want to have that and want to share that kind of same simple but happy life. Yes, yeah. yes. And this is so important when we look at immersion into nature and mm -hmm. living in harmony with our planet um, is one of the most important things in each other, in harmony with each other for, for being able to have peace on this planet together. And it makes total sense that you ended up picking up the Buddhism as well, with the, the <laughs> yes. growing up in nature. So what was it like then? Did you end up um, partaking uh, a lot in, the gr in growing food and making clothes yourself too? Or what, what was it like with, your, with the fellow people that you grew up with? Everyone is just farmers, you know, because you, you, ha you have to live on your own hands. So the first thing is you plant all the vegetables, all the wheat, corns, and all the fruits, vegetables, everything you need. And then, you know, after, after this, after you feed your whole family, if you have other time, then you can maybe do some extra work, like, you know, you can be, you can do some dancing music, right? But primary thing is everyone's peasants and happy peasants. So in my childhood, what I do, my playing ground is, is a creek, is, is a mountain. I'm, I hiking, I pick flowers, I choose the beautiful stones in the river, I try to catch fishes, you know. It was, that's all the, my toys and all my pleasure. So um, it is very difficult in, in the way that even as a child, I have to work in the field. You know? Yeah, well, like you indicated, if someone is uh, planting the food, they have to spend time farming the, the food every day, making sure that it's growing well, and then you can go do everything else. But here, everything's at supermarket. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes, here, yes, that's the thing. When, when I get out of my mountain, and I realize that people in the city, they know nothing about where the food come from, where yes. their vegetable, where the fruit come from. And they just, you know, they ask them, they, they will say the same answer, they come from Safeway, so. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um. at least go to, going to farmer's markets is very nice because then you can at least in, uh, ask the question, where is your farm, connect in a different way, but actually going and planting the food. And, and So that's interesting that you had that. And then playing in the creek as well, connecting to nature, these types of activities, just so important for development of your, of your spirit, really, in, in the world. And yeah, I'm glad you had that growing up. And then how about picking up your interests in, in uh, journalism and writing? How did you pick those up when you were younger? Well, I was always very into writing when I was very young. But I think one important factor is, um, you know, when you grow up in, in, the, in nature, that nature itself, nature mother itself, it gives you lots of inspirations, the beauty itself. Because yeah. 
sometimes you look at the sunset, a mountain there, it is a poem itself. Yes. And sometimes, uh, uh, you know, you feel you, you felt like there's so many stories behind all these things. And you heard these legend stories from, from you know, my grandma, from my neighbors. So these stories and on all this beauty, they just keep me, keep writing. I just, I just felt keep writing all the time. And then uh, when I went to university, I was like, wow, there's a major called journalism. You can literally living by writing and by, you know, traveling, good talking to people. I think it's fascinating, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that's why uh, then I, of course, I graduated a Master of Journalism and Communication, and then I become journalist, senior journalist, and keep working, and then I keep and start writing books, you know. It's just um, writing is what I've been doing all my life. <laughs> And then, so this is so beautiful, you said that the, the, even the sun and the moon and the horizon and sunset, sunrises, all these things, flowers going from the ground, trees, they're poems. They are. Well they said, are. Yeah. And you know that every time you pass by even the same view, even they didn't say anything, the mountain itself, the river itself, it feels like an old friend. It mm. feels like... It want to tell you something. Yes. So <laughs> you just you know, it, it just naturally blend into the inspiration nature gives you. Yes. Yes. Oh, this, see, it just seems like a young person growing up in a metropolis in the heart of the city it doesn't have access to the same uh, the same uh, because of light pollution you don't get to see the stars because <laughs> you don't grow food you don't get to you don't get to play in the creek or learn how to talk to, to learn from the mountain or see the sun all these types of things so it's a big disconnection from where we come from from nature yes yes that's actually i think it's really a pity it's really um nowadays you know when p kids grow up in the city they grow up with Kindle and, you know, computers and TV set. Uh, it's, they were really, they, they forgot that to connect with nature, it's, it's part of who we are. Yes. And yes. And, the, and a lot of why we have so many of the issues in our world is because we lost that connection to nature. Okay, and then so it was. Um, it was in Nanjing Noma University was where where you did the journalism communication, and then um, senior journalism for about six years or so in China. Now, what is it like being a journal? What topics were you cover were you covering in China? I'm mainly covering business and uh, technology, sometimes a financial, but you know it's all related. So what I where I'm working, Zhejiang province, it's a very unique province in China. I can say it's, it's our richest province in China. Uh, the entrepreneurs, the startups there, they're very active. So, and I do learn a lot from them. And I felt them very inspiring and they're also very hardworking. Um, the famous one, like um, Jack Ma, is one, mm -hmm. one of the judge entrepreneur. So, cool. Yeah. And so you're writing a lot about the tech and entrepreneurship finance scene, this type mm -hmm. of stuff. And then maybe give us some of the like ideas. Was was it kind of similar to in terms of like Silicon Valley, like in terms of tech advancements? Is it kind of similar that people were kind of making software and hardware and trying to make things more smooth? Um, that's a difference. So in China. Uh, manufacturing is still is still a big thing. So um, what I'm what what I'm working on is you know there's of course there's still like uh, software, hardware, you know, advanced technology. Of course, China is catching up very you know very very rapidly. But uh, the traditional manufacturing is still one pillow industry, and uh, like. Um, we call smart factories. Nowadays we call smart factories. But before all the internet of things and cloud, 
computing, before all this technology, they're just factories, you know. So there's lots of, lots of entrepreneurs, they're still working on traditional factories, but when this technology, all this technology come, what their challenge is they have to pick up quickly, they have to use them quickly, otherwise they're going to be lagged behind. So that's a big difference, I think, compared with the Silicon Valley tech. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And then um, what was it then that brought you then to going, coming to the United States and wanting to write your first book? Mm -hmm. Teach us about Give that. Me. Yeah, so it's also uh, related to, uh, you know, I think from 2014 and 2015, the entrepreneurs in China, especially in Zhejiang province, they were just so eager to learn. That's the year when big data, when, when cloud computing, when internet of things, when all, and when AI, you know, later blockchain, when all these technologies suddenly, you know, it's just overwhelming. Yeah. And every day, I can feel the anxiety of the Chinese entrepreneurs. They were like, if I don't study today, I'm going to die tomorrow. So they put lots of effort in studying this technology. Yes. They want to figure out what it is, how it's going to relate it to my future. So I've been involved a lot in reporting such kind of, um, you know, uh, use new technology to improve our industry, this kind of topic. And uh, of course, the most important question is everyone in China try to figure out what is happening exactly with all the technology. What, what, where it come from and where it's going to be. So with all, with these two main questions mm -hmm. and uh, mm, way I start collaboration with uh, Pierre Scorofi, um, he's, uh, you know, he's author of History of Silicon Valley mm -hmm. and um, he's a cultural historian, but he's also, he ha he also has a very good insight of technology. Mm, that's why in 2016, mm, we start our first collaboration in Human Can 2.0, a book I'll talk about the trends of technologies. That's a, this is a, so interesting that when you take all these different fields like the Internet of Things and cloud computing, blockchain, AI, that when you take them and then you say that there are people that are watching that explosion of technology happening and then they say, okay, if I don't study this stuff, big data, if I don't study this stuff, I'm going to get left behind. Yes. So I have to study this stuff. Yes. I have to know how it's applying to our world today, how it's going to apply to our world, how I have to teach it to the kids, all this type of stuff. Exactly. And so to write about it and then to explain that, you know, humans really are going to be much different. Like you were telling me, like half human, half robot future. And so this sort of, of, of writing about the, us being reshaped by the emergence of all this technology, I think that's a very powerful first um, yeah, book. Thank you. Yes, yes. That's mainly with what we're talking about, you know, in Human Camp 2.0. Uh, and actually, that book also lead to why I start writing this piece technology book. Yes. And this it, just released. Yes, it just released uh, this year, um, mm -hmm. one month ago. Mm -hmm. So after collaboration with Piero Scorofi finished the first book, uh, Humankind 2.0, I realized one big question is, I was here interviewed Silicon Valley experts, entrepreneurs, scholars for two months. So every time I ask them, in the end, always one same question what if this technology is used like say um, not properly a weaponized yes detect, yeah. you know and uh, who is going to be responsible for that you know wherever the people tell me how powerful it is the biotech you know like gene editing ai like when i ask the same question to this to these uh, thinkers, experts, they tend to give me the same answer, like technology is just a tool. Everyone says you know? that same thing. Yeah, everyone tell me it's it just a tool. It depends on how you're going to use it. And that's it. And 
if you are good people, you can use a hammer to like say you can build a furniture. If you are bad people, you can use a hammer to kill someone. And that's not what we can control. But so I just not happy with this answer. Likewise. Yeah. And you are basically the the people I interview, the all I can say the they are all the smartest people group of smartest people in this world, in this, you know, biotech, AI, they're all big names. But so you are telling me there's literally nothing we can do. And with all these powerful, even scary technology. So I'm not happy with that. And I, wa I want to explore like more answers, right? And then that's where I find Peace Innovation Lab at Stanford. Yes. And what they are doing is actually they're trying to find, in a way, they are trying to find the answer. They, you can tell from the name, Peace Innovation. Mm -hmm. So they were trying to say in Silicon Valley, technology can solve, seems can solve all the problem, but you know, in terms of create a peaceful society, a peaceful world, a better world, what exactly we can use technology for? So that's why it in leads, leads us to, Piero and I leads to this book. We start collaboration with Peace Innovation Lab. Oh, it's been the same thing since I've been here. I've been asking the same questions. And it's, mm -hmm. it's the, why is it the main answer? I think it's because it gets people to get you away from them fastest. You know, <laughs> it's, it's just a tool. It can be used either good or bad. I know, it feels like a standard answer. And, yes. And I think it's, it's really difficult because, you know, Actually, I love one scientist. He, she, she gave me, she gave me a different answer. She said, "You know what? Why you ask me? I'm a scientist. I know how to develop this technology, but how to use it? Don't you think you should ask the, you know, everyone? No. Who? You know, don't you think it should like it's you guys are using it? I'm, I'm not the one can tell you the principles, oh. the morality, you know. Oh my gosh, we need. To yeah, philosophers and uh, moral scientists, uh, thinkers. Yeah, uh, we need them involved, ethicists involved as soon as possible. Yeah, exactly. So after she gave me that answer, I think she's right. You know, why we give, why we put all the pressure on scientists? Like scientists have to answer all the questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, <laughs> it's not fair, but it is true that the philosophers, the everyone, you and him mm. and the kids in high school, everyone who are using technology should be responsible in answering the question, should be involved in answering the question. So, and uh, yeah. turn out it's very true, to answer this question, it becomes a like interdiscipline yes. project. Yes. It has to be. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is pr probably one of the most important things that we can start doing is having young people start thinking about the, the complex uh, philosophies and moralities and ethics around the exponential technologies. And then also to get those, peop those people in those fields, philosophers, scientists, uh, ethicists, um, moral scientists, involved in AI yes. creation and blockchain development and yes. um, biotech, it's all these fields, as soon as possible. I, I'm happy that that's the, 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 you know, you're driven to write this. Let's also explain how um, we need, this is, this is kind of what we're talking about with this technology for preventing um, and reducing conflict, um, for increasing positive engagement between individuals, groups, and nations. Mm -hmm. Yes, so let's, let's start unpacking um, some of the ways that we can, let's define, let's define mm -hmm. peace. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, Normally, when we say peace, we actually only mean we don't have a war, you know. Um, so this kind of peace in academia, there, there's an academic term called negative peace. It's like I have peace with this table, I have peace with him, with that war. There's no war, there's no conflict, but that's it. 
And there's obviously there's there's a different relationship like between you and me. We are not just no conflicts. We are friends. We are you know uh, we can collaborate to do lots of things. So in this kind of piece, always it's more interesting and more valuable. So mm. so we this kind of piece, it's kind of like positive engagement. Mm -hmm. So we call it positive piece. Yes. Yeah. So this is this this definition of peace is not like a novel idea. You know, it was it was there decades ago. Um, it's just now when we look at in look at into this definition, we realize now it's a it's a world of technology, and in terms of uh, working on peace. There, there is potentially a lot of new tools, new methods, you know, lots of things to explore, yeah. I really like this definition because it almost seems like the, the, uh, the, what we hear about peace is, like you said, just, oh, there's not war, so it's kind of like neutral state of, oh, yeah, they are, they're over there, they do their thing, um, there's just, yeah, no conflict and stuff. But positive peace is, hey, I know you're there, I have you know, deep love and desire to collaborate and we can explore collaboration. I think that's so beautifully said that if we can stretch ourselves to like positive peace worldwide, I think that's extremely powerful. And then also there is, that doesn't mean no competition because competition is still good for getting ideas out there and all these types of things. So, but positive ideas, positive collaboration, positive peace, I like that a lot. And then what about then um, measuring peace in the stories of specific applications of peace technology? How would we be able to measure it? Yeah. So. Um, about uh, peace technology. So yes. about this term, there's there's a few sentences I still want to say. You know, uh, this term actually I think it uh, come it came out like 2015. There's there's uh, one important principle I love a lot is when we talk about peace technology, um, what we are discussing is not about. Uh, this technology is, is powerful or not, it's good or not, or good or bad, or who should control it. China should control it, US should control it. It's not about all this. Peace technology, the fundamental thing about it is, it is something we should, technology is something we should um, collaborate together to develop it, to use it, to get other people to use it, make sure this tool, this technology can benefit all of us. Yes. So this, this um, principle I want to emphasize because you know, that's a whole point of peace technology. And so because peace has you know, negativities and positive peace, so peace technology um, naturally has two kinds of applications. One is you use technology uh, to reduce conflict mm. or um, you know, re reduce or minimize uh, con uh, war or conflict and or prevent you know, or you, know, you give uh, early, early um, alarms or conflicts. These all are on this zone, okay, so conflict an, zone. So an example of uh, like a negative uh, Peace technology could be something like um, developing military weaponry to observe other uh, countries' development of weaponry, and this is this stuff like that. Is that potential? Yeah, it, there's already lot of this uh, peace technology in working on you know reduce or uh, prevent conflict. Uh, for example, there's um, USIP. It's a United States uh, of uh, peace. So. The, it was established in uh, 1984, I believe. So they were working on this area a long time, uh, has a long history. In 2015, they, uh, they um, established a lab called Peace Tech Lab. Mm -hmm. So this lab, for example, they have, they, they sponsored, um, uh, they helped, I'm not sure how much they sponsored, helped um, stop from Indian. What they do is very simple. They, the three girls in India, they develop an app in, for the people, in, for the women living in, uh, you know, that 
the terrible neighborhood, like slum, you know. Um, it's very simple. Whenever you sense danger, mm -hmm. you can immediately click the app, and it will say it will send your your um, your location, your message. You know, like um, the thing you can set yes. advance to all your friends and families. Yes, that so you need help. Yes, yes, you need help. This is very very simple Positive application. Positive peace technology. Yes, but it is peace technology because you are working on prevent and reduce a conflict. Okay. Yes. Okay. 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 I see, I see. And that's that's a really good example. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a good example of yeah. yeah. But then the other one it seems like one that sometimes um, governments around the world kind of justify their military developments because oh there's so many threats around the world and like there are actually yes some threats and so there is some seems like there's some justification but it feels like if we did what we talked about at the beginning of just this connection deeper to nature to source to what what sustains us all we wouldn't need so many of the yes we wouldn't need any of the military conflict yes yeah, so about this i want to give another example so uh there's there's um a non-profit uh, organization called Peace Factory. So it was started in 2012 um, in the Middle East. So uh, when the war, when the war between Iran and Israel, Israel is going to uh, you know start, and so everyone knows it's going to be a war, and of course everyone is scared. And this journey. Uh, he just he he simply post he just posts a picture of him. He's he's a father. He's an engineer, and he just simply posts he, uh, he and his daughter's picture together, and with with a sentence, um, uh, Israel, uh, we uh, you uh, we love you. Uh, we will never bomb your country, mm -hmm. and. With this picture, and then on Facebook, it spread very quickly. And in next morning, when he opened the Facebook page, he saw like lots of lots of uh, forward, lots of people crying. People really moved by it, and very rapidly, people volunteered to post such pictures to connect more people. Because one key point, like you just mentioned. Every country have their need to defend their security. When they acclaim a war, they will say, we have to do it because we have to protect our country, protect our people. But in reality is, when you don't have any connections, when, when you don't even know who is your enemy, you only know from the TV, from the news. So what you, what you get is, you, the people you are going to start a war is just someone like crazy, you know. You never even have sit down with a real yes. person, uh, you know, you call enemy to have a coffee or conversation with. Yes. So, so this peace factory, peace factory founder Ronnie, he he think he thought it's a huge problem. Then he used Facebook as a tool to connect the people in the Middle East. To connect Iran's and and Israel's, you know, connect the people there, and encourage people to have conversation, to connect it, and uh, to know each other better. To know that they are not just monsters, crazy people throw bombs to you. They are also like everyone else. They are fathers, they are mothers, you know. Yes. They are normal people like everyone else. They are, their kids also like our kids. You know, they smell, they want to go to school, the same thing. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, another example that you, even Facebook, you know, is such such simple tool and you can use it to change something, yes. to make a difference. Yes. I love this example, the Peace Factory example. It can even do things like, uh, like get, per, potentially even prevent uh, war prevent conflicts um, if you get enough people it's such an easy thing to do this is a good potentially recommendation for those at home is to do something like take a picture of yourself 
um, maybe with your loved one or whoever, and take the picture and write in the caption or maybe take it with an image of another country. Um, and write, hey, like, I would love to meet someone from this country for coffee or tea and talk to you and get to know who you are and um, we'll never harm you, you know? Yeah. Stuff like that. I love that. That's a really yeah. good one. So that, that is also, um, that is also later, this Ronnie, uh, he reached to Peace Innovation Lab at Stanford. Um, and they, they were, uh, together they were discussing how we can, you know, really use technology to build more connections and then better communication. And then yes. finally we build trust, we yes. build cooperation. And the beautiful thing is the moment I know you, the moment I cooperated with you, the chance that I will start a war with you, I kill you, is very, very low, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. Versus seeing over the internet the fear propaganda yes. type thing yes. and never meeting someone from that place in person. Uh, yes. Heighten the chance of conflict. Yes. Yeah. So it is very powerful in the way um, you, don't, you don't see people just as them, just them, just a big them, big enemies mm -hmm. and you actually individual them yeah, you yeah. see them one by one as just one person yeah and it then it will make you really difficult to say i want harm i want to kill or just you know do something terrible to that person yeah yes yes and um this was also mentioned on our episode with uh, tim draper where he said that when you see people that are con uh, conflict across countries it's usually just like presidents or the people that are uh, running the countries as government officials and stuff like that conflict across countries but then he says i have so many friends in that country and we have such good friendships in that country and so that you got to always remember that you know really feel that that by making friends in other countries those are the real ties, not the ones of the governments that are, that's all, a lot of that is just fear propaganda. And so I, I, I like this one. And I think that's a really good action item for people as to, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to make a post myself about that. So I hope yeah. other people make those posts and hopefully have them liked and shared by other people. That's a really good one. Yeah. So that's why, uh, you know, um, when, when I was writing this book, uh, that's one important um, goal or say vision I am expecting from this book. Because literally that technology is something is everywhere now. And if you, if you ask a people you never know uh, who have different religion, who sp speak the different language, right? A stranger. If you ask them to do something, a simple thing, it will be very difficult. But if you ask them, hey, add me Facebook friend, or you know, oh, let's share a car, let's uh, use Airbnb, no problem. People can easily, with this technology, they can actually connect it and uh, do something together. But without this technology, if you try to do something with very different, you know, um, background, it's another story. So the potential, the beauty of technology today is it is actually more powerful than even religions, than any like kings or um, you know popes in the history. Can. So this is also the words from Peace Innovation Lab, the director, Mark Nielsen. So he was telling me when I just met him, he was telling me like, I was, he said, I'm so, so shocked when I see in 2009 that, you know, people, everyone just using Facebook, they volunteer to upload a lot of their personal data, pictures, and they don't ask a pay back, you know. They, yeah, <laughs> and everyone just volunteer do the same thing. And he was shocked. He said, he said, uh, and also in a later he saw Twitter, he saw Uber, I and mean, all these technology companies arise, right? He said, who in this world can persuade so many people to do the same thing? 
Yeah. You know, accord, you know, beyond all your language, your country, your religion difference, you are doing the same thing. You're speaking the same language by using the same tool, Facebook, Google, all this, you know, Uber, Ami, the same tool. Mm -hmm. So this is very powerful, but we just get used to it. The real important thing is, since it's everywhere, it means everyone has a potential to use it to do something good with it. Yeah, and we, it was that the, it seems like the technology being there for free, enhancing our lives was the reason why we all ran to go sign up for it and give away everything because we could freely enhance our lives. Um, just needed a connection to the internet and a computer. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's, let's cover on a measuring piece. Oh, no? yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, so to marry piece, you know, that's a very difficult issue. Uh, it's because, mainly because when we define peace as positive engagement, we first, the first thing we need is what we call data. We call peace data. So, because if you don't know what the engagement between us is like, like how many times I meet you in one month, how yeah. many times when I meet you did I hug you, did I give you eye contact, yes, yes. you know, all these Oh, small, small uh, engagement. Yeah. It matters. If yeah, you, yeah, it does you, matter. Yeah, if yeah. you if you put a bunch of people in the room, it can be a small group. It can be a lot of people. Then, if you observe carefully, how they engage, you yeah. know, how, yes. uh, what's the, what's the engagement like? It, so you if you have all these data, and then you can of course you can do something. So. Uh, the peace data, it actually, there's already um, some specific um, application like mirror, mirror uh, communication in teams, mirror um, innovation, mirror, mirror cooperation. So th in this book, we also uh, get a lot of inspiration from these um, different uh, methods from different teams. But what the unique thing about mirror peace is it's related to so much more data than just mere innovation or trust or cooperation. It, it means all this engagement between you and me, between Piero, between him, all this engagement has to be mirrored, recorded yes. first. Yes, yes. And when you mirror this data, there's not just I shake hands with you, I hug with you mm -hmm. or not, I communicate with you or not. Uh, it's also one important thing is why, why I, you know, yes. I, I, I just shake your hand, I'm not, I'm not kissing you, yes. right? Yes. The relationship between us is different. Yes. And the relationship between us is different is we believe, the PC Innovation Lab believe it's related to a lot to group identities. The group identity means uh, like who you are. You, you must belong, somehow belong to a group. For you belong to who you are. You are, um, you know, you, you are a um, host. You are, um, um, you, you um, male, you are a um, writer, you are artist, you know. And everyone, the way you label yourself is one of your group and they didn't. When, um, and, and we believe uh, in Peace Innovation Lab, there's um, one concept is that lots of conflicts, they arise is, is mostly because that our group identity, when I met you, I start knowing you, the first thing I noticed is how different you are. Mm. Like for example, mm. I'm a Buddhist. Why you are not Buddhist, you are like, you know, you are, a weird religion I never heard of, when you're so different on me. Mm. You know, people, sometimes we all know, sometimes even you did nothing wrong, you just belong to a different group. People can already start suspecting, you yeah, know, yeah. like you are not one of us, yeah. you are one of them, Damn. you yeah, know. Yeah. When they start look at the difference the different group identity between people, that's when the war starts arising, yeah, yeah. you know. 
And it's, it, versus human yes. first, and then, yeah. then, then there's there's something like a peace index that can almost be measured between uh, people. You can look at people and see how they react, and you know why are they only shaking hands instead of hugging, like you were indicating earlier? Could if they hug and they hug for maybe like thirty second hug, long hug, yes. maybe then maybe that means there's a higher peace index. Who knows? Peace rating, measuring peace. Yeah. Yes. So we do. Um, we do want to uh, mirror. You know, what's a beauty thing about today's technology is they do enable us to capture all these engagement. We have all these sensors, cameras everywhere, right? Mm. If you want, you can easily record it. For example, if you have a team, a, you have a staff for. Uh, uh, t uh, 10, even 20 people working together, you can easily record when you have meetings, how everyone engage, how everyone speaking yeah. to each other, right? Yes, yes. So to record this data is, is become feasible. And the theory behind it, like what I just said, is that the conflict usually related to when I see a difference between you and me. When I see a different, uh, what we call group identity. But on the other hand, that also means if I'm able to see more um, similarities, common things between you and me, and then maybe yes. the relationship is going to change. You can see very common that when two people start knowing each other, oh, we're from the same town. Wait, we share the like the 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 same school or you know the same experience can suddenly make two people very close, right? So the that gives that gives the room for technology uh, how we can apply um, how we can use technology to help people to find more uh, things in common rather than things like you are just different you know i love this one yeah. this one's so good like you said it you can approach someone and say oh i'm a buddhist well what why are you a different religion <laughs> or you can approach them and say oh like who are you you know you are another human what are things do we have in common instead of what things do we have different yes and then how can you start from there you know the place of love and compassion and asking questions and learning um I love that. I think that's a good one. And leveraging technology to be able to do that. Can you record a meeting can, uh, and see how people inter interact with each other, this type of stuff. But then you can also maybe nudge like people gently, like if two people are maybe using words and you can maybe process natural language process and see who has sentiment that's more aggressive or something like that. Exactly. Maybe you can nudge them towards peace with technology. Exactly. You know, that's actually when, when I was discussing uh, this peace technology in AI, there's, for example, there's one beautiful example uh, when now we can talk to robots, right? You can, you can always say, um, what's a robot name? Alex? Um, Hi, when you, hi Alex, mm -hmm. it, right? Alexa is the Alexa, Amazon, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, you can try to talk to them, but, but sometimes their answers is not like, mm, not good enough. When, when you say, for example, when you say, oh, today I feel I'm depressed, I'm sad. And you will, you, you will see that the robot we immediately will say, I suggest you go to listen some music or have a walk with friends. And the reality is after you hear, heard this, you don't feel better. So, mm. Mm. And, and that is thing is, if we can try to make this AI, make this technology have more empathy, mm -hmm. like the, the same concept you are saying, um, we, so the, in this book, we mentioned that if we can use, there's a communication, communication theory called non-balanced communication. Mm -hmm. So with this communication theory applied to AI, maybe later when you talk to the robot, you say, hey, Alex, um, today I feel sad. And, and this robot will try to feel you. And, oh, okay, I understand your feeling. You know, I, it, will, it will answer you different. Yes. And make you feel more like 
old, I mean, understand. Not just someone immediately tries to say, just go to listen to some music, you know? Yeah, yeah. So this is another very detail that also that you can use AI or use technology to enhance the positive engagement even before, even between robots and the human. Yeah. And also when you are writing, you know, emails, te- you know, test, you can also use AI to do the same thing. When you write an email, you say, I really don't like you. I, you know, when you write this sentence, yeah, the, yeah. there's going to be some conflict. Red around, highlight right? that shows up. Yes. And then, do you, are you sure you want to send this? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same concept. So if we, if we can focus more on, you know, the goal, what's the goal of using AI? What's the goal of robots surrounded us everywhere? The, is the goal to, you know, to service our human to have a better life or you know have a have a better world if if that's so then we want to apply all this empathy you know positive engagement even with robotics so that's uh, another <laughs> <laughs> yeah these are such good examples jingsha i feel like we're finally starting to really instead of just say oh technology is just a tool can be used for good or bad here it's like no, we know how to use it for good. We know how to use it for peace. So let's move it in this direction. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So for the entrepreneurs, for the, for the people who are developing using technology, so they, of course they want to say, we don't want to do harm. We don't want to be evil. But the question is, we also don't know how to be good. Like what? How can I use my technology to be good? They got confused. What's the principles? What's the guidelines? They also don't know. So that's why, that's also I think the research of peace technology matters. Because you, you, you need to come up with all these guidelines, these principles to tell everyone if you can use technology this way, use your AI this way with more empathy, you know, if you can use your, your tools to, to increase the positive engagement between people, if you can increase in general people's ability to be good to each, each other, then, okay, you are in a good direction, you can keep going. Otherwise, maybe, you know, you should be more careful, you know. Um, this is, is also one, um, one thing that I really uh, looking forward that, you know, this book will make a, a difference, even a slight difference. It's going to. Yeah. It already has. It already did in my life, and it likely already did for Ron, and it likely already did for the people that are viewing this. So yeah. the butterfly effect and all the people that are at the Peace Innovation Lab, all the people that you talk to about this, it makes a big effect. It's the butterfly effect. And then we go and we talk more about it. Really, I urge, I urge you all to take a look at Peace Tech, please. This is very beautiful. I'm so happy that we're having this, this conversation. And you're, yeah. Design. you're, yeah, you're, you're right about, on, um, on, um, these are the technologies that can improve collaboration, that can improve peace and how we can apply it. So what do you then, um, do you expect then that more people are going to uh, be more conscious about peace technology and about moving us in that direction? Yes, of course. And uh, like I said, um, because technology is a universal tool, it's it, it, literally even a teenager can, can do something about it. And, if, and no matter who you are, no matter what profession you are, you know, you, you can, as long as you are aware that technology is something impact our life, everyone's life deeply, and we don't want to wait too late to do something good. We want to do it now yes. before it's too late. Yes. So uh, I think, you know, to marry in peace is the first step, and then we can do something about it, right? The first step of Mm, later what we can do after we I, I should finish that 
after we collect the data between us, between it can be two people, but it can can also be in a group. It can even be between cities. It even can be between countries. It depends on how much data you have, right? So the first step, when you collect enough engagement data, the second step is you try to figure out everyone. You you have the ability to do something means. After you have this data, you can detect the specific problem in your community, in our team, in the company, or in the city. You can detect. You can know specifically why in this city the public don't communicate well with the government.、Mm. You can know better what is wrong, which part is the problem.、Mm-hmm. When you have the insight from the data, you can see. Oh, maybe it's because the government never really talk to the people well. So when you diagnose the problem, be very specific. Then you can try to use technology to solve this problem. So you can create a prototype, and you can measure the whether this technology. It this technology can be a website, can be an app, can be anything. You know, determining on what's the problem you find, and then you try to use this technology to commute to connect and. You know, enable better communication. Anything increase that the positive engagement, positive peace. So that is the part that you know the next step after you marry peace. What really you can do? It's making a lot more sense to me. Your upbringing when you're growing up in rural with nature. And how you also did all the、uh, journalism around technology, and then how it all brings us to this peace technology. You had the initial immersion into nature. You had Buddhist principles as well. You did the journalism in the tech sector and, and entrepreneurship and science and stuff like that, finance, and it pieces together into into this. And so, I think you're doing in such incredible work with this book. We, I think we should. Sit down again at a future time to actually give more examples、mm-hmm. of peace technology and explaining how it is a very successful in its deployment, and also how、uh, some of these new exponential technology fields how we can、uh, potentially recommend. Um, ethicists or、uh, philosophers or moral scientists to enter into those fields for greater high likelihood of peace technology, where maybe some areas don't have peace technology yet. Where what examples could be deployed? Because people listen and then they go, "Oh, I can build that peace technology." Yes. This type of stuff. Yes, actually. So, I recommend it. There's one peace build peace database. This is a website. You can you can see all the all the you know cases examples all what people already do with peace tech. So you, you can see,、uh, this database build peace database. Build peace database. database. Is yes. There, is, okay. Is there a, do, do we know if there's is like buildpeacedatabase.com or something? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. And, cool. Because we'll link that in the bio for everyone. Okay. Yeah. And and also I also would like to recommend、uh, Peace Innovation Lab at Stanford. I mentioned、yes. it lots of times.、Uh, it is as far as I know, Mark Nelson, the director. He's the one that,、uh, and also the co-founder Margaret.、Yeah. So they two are really、uh, the visionaries, you know, in use technology to increase positive peace. So before them, like U.S. IP Peace Tech Lab, you know, there's lots of like peace factory. They're working on prevent and com- reduce conflict. But in terms of how to increase ability to be good to each other. There's still lots of discussion, a、uh, very big, in you know, peace data. What is peace data, right? How to define it? How we can really use technology to collect and、uh, measure this thing? So this work,、uh, I think, Peace Innovation Lab, they did fantastic work, and you can simply go to their website to check. 
Yes, that'll be another link in the bio of the mm -hmm. Stanford's Peace Innovation Lab. That's another mm -hmm. big one. Okay, really good, really good. Um, I'm just, again, I'm just so impressed with what this is about, with what Peace Tech's about, with what you guys have put together. I'm very, very impressed. And I'm, I'm looking forward to what young people can take and, and see the world through this perspective of peace technology um, applied to every field applied to bringing us together I'm, I'm i'm a huge fan and and i want to like i said i want to do another episode where we actually break things down in deeper i'm we give more examples that'll be a good yes. one let's yes. do that yes okay let's thank do you that. yeah thank you i'm I, let's ask you two questions on the way out okay that we ask on the show the first question is do you think we're in a simulation do you think we're in simulation? Yeah, do you think we're in a simulation? Oh, that's a <laughs> <laughs> very interesting question. Um, um what's the what's usually you get to answer? What's the <laughs> <laughs> what's the usual yes. answer? <laughs> Some people think yes, some people think no, some people give some, you know, context around why they think that way. Some people say maybe because of this or that. Well, I just like this beautiful name. <laughs> it's an interesting name. Yes. Yeah. And it, it goes into a lot of different places with it, yeah. yeah. So, I want to ask you why in the beginning you come up with name first? Well, it does lead to a lot of... Um, uh, important fields of, uh, of study for humans, a word like that can lead to a lot of good studies for humans to understand our, our reality that we live in and a lot of other good things. But, um, and we can talk more, you can maybe, uh, since you're a journalist, you can maybe sit down with me and I can, I can uh, unpack this more. Uh, for you if you're if you're interested in it yeah I, I think it's very interesting but it's difficult for me to simply to say yes or no because I feel yes, yes. right it it's something behind yeah. it's much more to be discussed so. yes yes okay good well we can discuss more than on another time okay mm -hmm. and then what about what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world the most beautiful thing in the world um, I think is when when your heart is is literally you know is i can say maybe happy is not accurate mm. happy and peaceful yeah when you are when you can feel at this moment you're peaceful and you're happy I think that's the most beautiful moment. That's the most beautiful thing. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Oh, it's so warm. Ah, to have that on a moment-to-moment -moment basis around the world of, of a happy and peaceful state of living together harmoniously with nature. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. Thank you. Jingxia, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for teaching us about your yeah. book. Thank you, thank you. My thank you, pleasure. it's been a pleasure learning more about you and your life. Okay, thank you everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We would love for you to check out the links in the bio below. Go and check out jingshanu.com as well as the website, um, as also the Amazon book link, check it out. Go and support the book, support Peace Tech. Go talk to your friends, your families, coworkers, people online on social media about Peace Tech. Spread more examples of peace technology around the world and do that thing that we mentioned during the show. Take a picture of yourself, maybe with your family, with your friends, and say that, that you want to ensure, you want to push peace technology around the world, that you want to ensure safety and no uh, violence around the world, things like that. That can really help us make a better world together. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the scientists, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support Simulation, all of our links are below. Support us on Patreon, on PayPal, on crypto currency all our links are below support us also if you want to design cool merchandise and get paid for it the ub link to the merchandise is below check that out and go and build the future everyone shout out to ron vogas for producing and directing thank you very much ron and go and build the future everyone manifest your dreams into the world thanks for tuning in we'll see you soon